Hi, everyone. We're just uh, waiting a few minutes for Ezra to um, find a picture of a pizza because he's been in Rome and uh, <laughs> eat, eaten several of them there by the looks of it. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> but it's true. That's the pizza. <laughs> Can you see it? Oh, oh very quite, good. Quite a nice pizza. Pistachio in the crust. It was lovely. Yeah. And a little drinky. Yeah. Is that ham, Ezra? Are you allowed ham? Uh, yes. No. <laughs> Shh. Don't tell anyone. Not everybody gets that joke, but we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll I'll stop there. <laughs> Look, I'm sending myself automatic replies. <laughs> okay, let's, let's get out of that. That's the proper screen, right? Cool. I think I still have another minute or so, right? Yeah, I'm trying to be like um, real precise, but everyone's coming in. Uh, Good. Five, uh, normal uh, rules apply. Um, Ezrael has uh, presented for us for several years now. Um, and um, uh, any questions you've got, if you pop them in the chat, Jenny or I will um, read them out. Um, uh, I don't know how much time we're going to have at the end for questions, Ezrael. Yeah. Given I, I know what your form is. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too many slides? Is that what it is? Okay. No, no, no. Because no, I'll try and leave. I'll try and leave room for a couple of questions. Extends the presentation. Um, yeah, if anyone's got any questions, just pop them in the chat, and um, um, we'll 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 interrupt Ezrael because he's quite used to it, and and ask them on your behalf. Can so, um, ten thirty. So without uh, uh, further ado, this is a, a performance. 101 course from uh, the highly experienced um, Ezra Gross. And uh, take it away, Ezra. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how to get into full screen mode. So give me one second here, because uh, normally I'd have a keyboard, right? Is it, is it not the little button at the bottom? That little picture. I'm trying to press oh. it. No, it doesn't work. No. Well, I can always just leave it like this. Or but you can see. say, probably can say view. Or oh, slideshow, slideshow. It, it, not the icon at the bottom. Right. On the right-hand side. That's there we go. Yeah. No, you know what it is, is uh, normally I'd have an external keyboard and be easier to do, but just on my laptop, you have to figure out how to use the function keys, right? So. <laughs> well, it looks great. Good. Ready to go then. So welcome. My name is Israel Gross. I'm a, a principal solutions advisor here at Rocket Software. Um, and I specialize obviously in everything to do with kicks. And today we're gonna do a kicks performance tuning 101, right? We're not gonna focus on any particular tooling, although for Rob's sake, we'll do a, and talk a little bit about kicks performance analyzer as it comes up during the session. As Rob mentioned, I'm happy to take questions throughout the presentation, but uh, because we don't want all the noise uh, in the recording here, then uh, we suggest you just enter it into the chat and then Rob will interrupt me and, uh, and ask the questions as needed, right? So again, I'm gonna go through um, an introduction to tuning and some of the reasons to tune applications versus systems tuning. The bottom line is, is if you can tune your applications, you get them to run faster and you save some money, right? If you can reduce the CPU. So I'm gonna go through this whole tuning methodology. I'll go through anatomy of a response time and then some of the data collection facilities available to us today, some of the free ones. And then of course, some of the ones that uh, you can use uh, based on the tooling that you can purchase, right? So we'll talk about things like monitoring, DFH zero stats, some end of day statistics. And then I'll give you some examples of resources to tune. Some of them are a little bit older. I wouldn't focus as much on them. And I'm gonna describe for you where I find the, the where you make the, the, you get the best benefit in terms of tuning. So the first question is, is why would you tune a system? So there are some obvious reasons, right? If you get poor response times, whether it's applications or system, the network, uh, maybe how you uh, access data off of DASD, right? You're getting poor response times, certainly gives you a, a reason to tune. Perhaps your workloads are changing, right? Next thing you know, um, some company buys another company, you know, and then next thing you know, you're running double the workload or the volumes are increasing. I had one interesting uh, 
customer call the other day where they had some promotion for loans here in the U.S., one of the banks, and, you know, they advertised on TV and suddenly you see a blip where, you know, next thing you know, everything slows down. And so there are increased workloads that can cause problems. And so you might want to tune based on those. Maybe you're trying to postpone an upgrade or save some money. So there are several reasons that you could tune your applications. But when are when do you usually do the tuning, right? It's generally when a problem occurs. I find that uh, most customers, you know, given the time, they're busy with upgrades. They're looking at software products, you know, so they don't think about tune, tuning from time to time. So there are some reasons why people don't tune as often as they probably should. Uh, generally, I would say it's probably mostly because of lack of, lack of knowledge or lack of interest, right? Um, but it could be lack of resources, right? Today, there are more and more systems that less and less people need to manage and maintain. You could have some dependence on outside parties or outside software. There is the theoretical, if it ain't broke, don't fix it attitude, right? And then again, some people feel, well, if I have a third party package or application, there's no way that um, you know I can tune it. Also, in general, you can't figure out what the return of investment will be, right? So you can't figure out what you're going to get back once you do tune. So effectively, you're going to do all this tuning, and then you're going to save one or 2%, and it's going to take you a couple of days to do it. You're, you're wondering whether it's worthwhile. Right. But you're going to see that generally I'll give you some idea of what areas I would start with when I try and do some tuning. So some rules before you get started. First of all, tuning is top down. Right. You start from the big and you move down to the uh, smaller constraints. Right. So you want to make changes to major constraints first. You generally want to do one major change at a time. Sometimes you can combine a few. But generally, if you don't get the results that you expect. It's hard to figure out which one of them didn't give you the results that you wanted. So that's why we try and do less changes at the same time, right? And sometimes you have to iterate over changes. So an example of this would be, let's say, if you look using local shared resources in Kix, right? LSR pool buffer tuning, right? And, you know, sometimes you might need iterations to ensure you get the right look aside hit ratio that you're looking for. So it's not like it's a one shot deal and you're done. Sometimes you have to do it over and over again till you get the results you expect. Now, changes should be done gradually. Tuning will not always be effective. So don't assume just because it makes sense that it's going to work out the way you want it to, right? Uh, sometimes there are other constraints that it's hard to take uh, advantage of or, or, realize in advance that is going to cause you problems when you try and do tuning. So you don't tune for the sake of tuning and make sure you have a way to back it out if something goes wrong. So this is just the methodology, observe, measure, analyze, react, verify, and implement. And I'm going to go through these individually. So the general performance tuning guidelines is to start out by observing. You have to understand how your systems run. Every Kix region you're going to find out is slightly different. Sometimes you're going to get, you know, maybe you have a several application owning regions that are clones of each other. So they're very similar, but they're still going to have generally some constraints. Some people will run two or three or four AORs, but then they'll say, you know, AOR number four, I'm going to ship some workload, you know, specifically to that. So even so it matches the other AORs, it's slightly different, right? So you have to set up realistic objectives and you should develop a baseline. So the baseline is what you want to start with. You want to figure out this is how my region runs primarily pretty much the same every day, right? There might be some differences, maybe every Wednesday between 10 and 11, I get this burst of volume, but you want to figure out how your system runs, CPU utilization and overall kicks, number of tasks per hour, that kind of thing, peaks and averages, response times that you expect. Because if you don't see what you're working with to start out with, it's hard to figure out what you can fix, right? Then you have to measure, identify certain areas to tune. Anything to do with IO is always a good place to start because that will give you the biggest bang for your buck, let's say, for response times, right? And then, of course, you have to set that baseline again and then select the tools that you want to use. You can use things like DFH0 stat. If you're looking at vSAM files, you can do list cats. You can certainly use third-party monitors or tools like a Megamon for Kicks or Kicks Performance Analyzer, right? And you can take a look and measure what it is you might want to tune.
Then there's some analysis phase, right? You want to review the output, identify the tuning opportunities. So as an example, going back to that LSR example that I mentioned earlier, theoretically, you go in and you say, well, okay, the standard for look aside hit ratios on index should be 95% or higher. On data portion, it should be 80% or higher. So you analyze it and you figure out how well you're doing. And then you decide, well, if I give it X number of buffers, let's see what I'm going to get, right? When I iterate over it, and I might have to give it a little bit more. And then I have to decide how much storage I'm using, whether that's impacting the applications running in my system, right? So it's a bit of a give and take, right? Then you're going to react, make appropriate changes, use tester quality environments. First, of course, just to make sure nothing breaks, right? Generally, uh, you know, you can look at a tuning environment, right? And say to yourself, well, you know, why would I bother with development or QA when really production is the only place I'm gonna see the, the fruits of my labor, so to speak, right? So the answer is, is you also wanna make sure nothing breaks, right? When you start out by tuning, you wanna make sure nothing breaks. And so you go through the environments, even though you don't expect the results to show up there, right? Now, ensure you have a fallback position ready. So whatever you've done, make sure you can undo it very quickly because sometimes the results will be worse than you expected. Now, again, you have to verify those results, which means you need something to look at the data, whether you're looking at SMF using KixPA or you're using uh, DFH0 stat, if you're looking at statistics, right? So you wanna make sure that you've got the results that you want. A lot of people will do some tuning and they'll assume everything worked really well and then they won't go back and take a look at it. Um, and then over time, they'll notice things have gotten much worse. So you kind of have to look at it and you have to observe it over a couple of days and make sure that, yeah, these are the results I expected, and then you can implement it in production. So this is just a graphical view of what we mentioned earlier, right? It's just establish the baseline, monitor the system using the tools that you decided to do. Uh, did you meet the objective? No, then you have to identify performance constraints, determine required changes, and make those changes and implement it. Now, once you're done, you should document what you did and what the results were. It's always good that after a, an example of tuning, that you come back and you let everyone know how well you did. This is the mistake that I think a lot of people do, and that's probably why you don't get to tune very much in your environments, or maybe you do. But uh, if you don't, that's because if you don't show the results of the tuning effort that you've done, then a lot of people will turn around and say, yeah, it's not worth your time, right? And that can run into problems for you. So I always say document and show the results. Graphically is always a good thing to do as well, right? Because sometimes the percentage change looks much better in a picture. Management loves to see pictures. And so, you know, uh, one of the tuning efforts I've done recently, I managed to reduce the end-to-end uh, -end response time by over 15%. And on a graph, it looked really great. So how do we get started? First of all, Knowing uh, kicks in your application is not enough. You have to know the system because no two kick systems are exactly the same. Unless they're physically clones of each other, um, they will be slightly different. So you have to kind of know how the kick systems are structured that you're about to do some tuning in and what applications run within those systems. Okay. Now, what would you look at to start out in terms of tuning? First of all, if you're having problems, it's quite obvious. If you have response time problems, then obviously if you're getting poor response time, then you know that's something you want to take a look at. Generally, that's associated with weights. And what you want to do is ensure that the weights are decreased, right? You might have issues with processor overloaded, right? In the world of kicks, if you're not running applications, for example, thread safe, everything is running on the quasi reentrant TCB. And then the more workload you put onto that particular TCB means that the kicks region could be overloaded physically and he's spending too much time switching between tasks, right? And so that can affect your end-to-end -end response time. It can also cost you in terms of CPU as well with tasks switching between, let's say, TCBs. So you can get CPU problems and costs Again, and then there's some obvious ones like provision for increased workloads. You know, one minute you're running X number of transactions per second and someone decides to put a new application in your system because they're merging environments from some company you took over or something like that. And then suddenly your kicks regions are running more workloads. So you have to take a look and see if there's something you can do to tune the system for that increased workload. 
There could be some availability and reliability problems you're dealing with, lack of certain types of kicks resources. And again, you always set a capacity planning baseline because that's the other thing people love to know. They say, based on your current projected rate of growth, right? When will I run out of CPU? When will the box be too small to run my workload? So somebody in capacity planning has to decide when you want to upgrade to the next Z, whatever it is, Z16 or whatever it's going to be called. Well, today we have the Z16, but nonetheless, whatever the next Z machine is or the larger machine based on the capacity that you're using. And then of course, there's always that realization of new technologies. You can run Java in Kicks. There's all kinds of new workloads that can come to the world of Kicks, and there's even workloads outside of Kicks that Kicks wants to invoke. So some of the big stuff in the last couple of years is outbound web service calls, right? And how long they take to physically run. You know, Kicks is subsec, and we go well, pretty much always rely on that. But when you're going out to some web server and you're doing some sort of an extract of data, and that server is not responding as fast as you'd like, next thing you know, that's holding up the Kicks transaction. The end-to-end -end response time to the user is going to look pretty bad. And so there are things you can do or put in place to ensure that these things run a bit faster. So. In terms of response times, when dealing specifically with those issues, you have to take a look at allocation of resources, uh, keep in mind what the processor speed is, and the design of the application code itself. Although you can sometimes make some changes in that area, other times not. It depends on the number of programmers you have in the environment. There's sometimes network response problems, although transmissions through the network are a lot quicker quicker today. DASD response time, whether you're doing caching and buffering and mirroring, you know, whether you're using solid date, solid state, or spinning disks today, right? So nonetheless, DASD could be an issue. And then of course the increased workload. So the first thing to understand is when you're looking at applications in the world of kicks, there's really three categories that I know of, right? There's the non-conversational. A lot of people don't think of about non-conversational transactions. Non-conversational to me is you're in, you're out, you're done. Yeah, it's a one-shot deal, right? Pretty much like the web. Yeah, When you go to a website and it displays a page, yes, you might drill down from there, but that first instance is a screen that you're gonna see and there's really no follow-up work until a user actually clicks on a button. So in the world of kicks, that would be something like running a transaction and there's no follow-up, right? It's not like a return tran ID with a com area and you, you have to go through 15 screens to get a business transaction done. The business transaction is non-conversational. Then you get some conversational tasks. We hope you don't have too many of those, not like all the IBM ones that run. Um, but nonetheless, the conversational tasks are something you have to pay attention to. And then most of our workload is pseudo-conversational, which says, yes, you're in, you're out, but you're not done because generally there's a follow-on button to press or there's some enter key or some other PF key on a 3270 that will drive you through several screens and that will take you through the business transaction. Now, when you're actually physically looking at these, and I use these pictures a lot, right, a business transaction is broken up into individual tasks, hopefully you know that by now, and each task can run several different programs. So this is kind of our pseudo conversational example. And when you're looking to tune or you're looking at it, excuse me, an, app, an application response time, you're looking at the task level, right? Not the full business transaction level. So uh, task to kicks is a unit of work, used to be called a logical unit of work. And that is the level that you can tune at, right? And that's how kicks runs. Now, when looking at the areas that you can tune, you'd notice that an application and whether it's COBOL or assembler or even Java, right? There's kind of two sides of the house that you can live on, right? One is the application side of the house, which says you're running inside your programming language, but whether it be COBOL or PL1 or whatever it might be. And then every so often you issue this exec CICS command that throws you off into the system. And then the system, right? You can end up with a situation where you're doing, let's say, file control and a weight could be involved, right? And so when you're looking at the entire application, there's the 
time you spend within the application itself and the time you spend within the system. Now, of course, when it comes to the application itself within the COBOL, there are some things you can do to tune and make it run faster. When you're on the system side of the house, a lot of the times it might require that you actually set up the resources slightly different. So we mentioned, for example, whether the file IO is in LSR or RLS, right? And that is how you might increase the end-to-end -end response time and reduce the wait time associated with the application. So you have to take a look at an overall application, right? The total response time is of course made up of the suspend time, the amount of time you're waiting and the dispatch time. Now, dispatch time does not mean you're getting CPU. Most of the time you should be getting CPU, but there could be other reasons that you're waiting. All of Kicks could be waiting because ZOS is dispatching other work at the ZOS level than Kicks itself. So from Kicks perspective, you're dispatched. You should be running and using CPU, but right now Kix itself is not getting any CPU. So those are the things you have to pay attention to. And then on the suspend time, you realize there could be some type of wait involved, but even once the wait completes, keep in mind, you could be waiting for redispatch, right? Because you're waiting again for that TCB, generally the QR, but it could be for one of the L8 or L9 TCBs. And then there's always a first dispatch delay, which hopefully should be short. So for example, if I were looking at problem analysis and I noticed that most of my transactions are waiting a couple of hundred milliseconds just for the initial start, that would tell me the QR TCB within that kicks region is overloaded. And I might consider splitting my workload out into multiple regions. So again, we mentioned the suspend time, the time the task is not executing. We mentioned the dispatch time. So these are just the notes. Uh, you could have CPU time, and then you could have this wait time that you're not aware that Kix is waiting. Now, what we like to see, and this is available if you run any of the statistics, is the CPU to dispatch ratio should be 80% or higher, which means that when kicks or your workload is being dispatched, you should be using CPU 80% of the time or higher. And in production, I tend to see it's in the 90 to 95% range generally, but if it's not at least 80, that means that kicks isn't getting dispatched enough to get your workload processed, right? So what about the types of weights? Interestingly enough, if you take a look at the types of weights in your system, most of them are associated with some sort of IO or terminal type wait, right? So if you're waiting terminal, then that's generally you know, a conversational transaction. But however, it's not necessarily conversational with your 3270 terminal. It could be a conversational wait because two systems are communicating, right? And you're over an MRO or an ISC type connection and you're waiting on another system. So that's still considered a terminal wait. The other types of weights in temp storage or transient data or journal, right, are all file related weights. You're waiting for IO, right? Till the IO completes, you can't get control back. Now, the newer type weights are things like inbound and outbound socket weight, right? We're waiting for the data to be transmitted from the web to us or a response from a call out to some web service. So that's the type of weighting you might see. There's also weighting associated with um, single threading through an application. So that could be an NQ weight or an interval control weight or a lock type weight. So these are the different types of weights that you could see within the environment. Now, in terms of response time, one of the cool things is, is this is probably in, I don't know how many different textbooks, I can't say I've stolen it. It's just something that we've seen over time is when you take a look at the transaction workload in your environment, no matter what your environment is, every response time kind of looks like this. There's acceptable response time toward the bottom of the graph. And then what happens is at some point in time, response time starts to get really, really bad, and it becomes an exponential graph. Because as it gets worse, it feeds on itself, right? And so, you know, if the response time is good, and then suddenly the workload in the system is increasing, increasing, eventually you hit this position where you just go up to infinity like that, right? And the reason is, is it just gets worse and worse, and it compounds on itself.
So the question is, is how do you make sure that you get good response time? The key is, and this is kind of sad, there is no way of figuring out what this little elbow is. It just happens, right? And every system, it will be different. So you can't compute it. What you just got to try and do is keep it so the response time is acceptable within the environment. So you have to do um, in terms of transaction workload, is it keep increasing it until you see that there's a piece of workload that starts to go up and make it exponential. And that kind of shows you the bounds of your system. And believe it or not, you can see it. If you can generate more and more and more workload, you can see it quite easily. And I have one of these workload simulators and generators, and I could show you this graph every single time. And depending on the system it is, there's that point in time where it's quite obvious that you've exceeded the amount of workload the system can handle, right? So what about instrumentation, stuff that you can look at to help you measure? So there's lots of stuff available today. Certainly kick statistics or CMF, right? SMF 110 type one or type two records. You can look at some aux trace. You can use the kicks performance analyzer, Omega Mon for kicks. And then there's various other different products out in the marketplace today. Some expensive, some cheap, some free, right? And whatever it is that you use, make sure you get accustomed to that instrumentation and get used to using it, you know, quite frequently if you want to do some tuning, right? But most of the time, the data that you have available to you is CMF based, right? Which is our SMF 110 type one and type two records, right? What is uh, CMF? Well, it's performance generally and statistics type data, right? There are some other um, classes, as you can see, we can see exception, identity, performance, and transaction resource. I usually always use performance and exception because you're not going to see, hopefully, a lot of exceptions. And the performance data is going to show you how each transaction in your system is running. Now, this can produce a significant amount of data. So you could decide to turn it on and off for certain intervals. Certainly during peak processing, you get a good feel how your system is running. At least Kix automatically compresses the data. You could exclude monitoring fields, but because of the compression available, I don't even bother with that anymore. I use an MCT to add fields that may not be available to you. And then you can use several different products to analyze the data. Again, DFH dollar malls is completely free. So again, the different data types, exception class I usually use because I don't expect to see a lot of exceptions in my kick system. So queuing for file strings or waiting on temp storage buffers will highlight problems in kicks. And so I always turn on exception class. Identity class is fairly new, provides some enhanced audit information, captures some identity propagation of data from a client system across a network. Um, it's new. I've seen some people use it from time to time. Uh, I don't use it on a general basis. Performance class is the one I want. There's one record per transaction. And this will show me things like CPU, wait time, what I waited for. There's lots of data inside of that particular SMF 110 type one record. And then transaction resource class, you just have to be careful with this because again, this will give you additional transaction information about individual resources accessed by a transaction. There's some items like DPLs or file access or temp storage. Uh, there's, I don't know, about eight different monitoring classes. And again, this can produce a voluminous amount of data. So you want to be careful before you turn that on, right? Now, again, DFH dollar malls is completely free. There's a sample program supplied with Kix. Uh, I tend to use Kix Performance Analyzer because it has about 250 built-in reports, much easier for me to use to try and analyze the data. Okay, But again, you can do sorting and printing with this. You can select and exclude data with this. Right, You have to unload the SMF data prior to using it. Uh, things like Kix PA can use unloaded SMF data or log stream data, which means I can run against my log streams you know, a couple of seconds after it occurred. Right, So let's talk about Kix monitoring. First of all, obviously, there are some SIT parameters you can set so that you decide what monitoring facilities are turned on for you. However, there is a transaction. A lot of people don't know that this exists. It's called a CEMN. And CEMN, when you type it in, you can see right at the top, uh, it gives you a bunch of choices. You can turn on the monitoring status. So this is how you turn it on. And then there's the different classes of data that you could turn on. 
Here is some resource limits for things like DPL file or TSQ, whether you have compression turned on, and then some converse and sync point status. And of course, I included the notes here. So if you hit PF1 when you go into CEMN, you will see this same screen. And then it'll show you what some of these things mean, like DPL resource limit, the maximum number of DPLs for which the resource class data is collected. And so you can see from the page before, you can go as high as 64, right? So it's not unlimited, but nonetheless, you can get quite a bit with this. And then uh, again, compression status by default is yes. Converse whether you want a separate performance class record produced for conversational tasks. So you can read the notes and decide what you want to turn on. Now there is a second page if you page down and you can see this is a frequency, how often to collect data associated with conversational tasks and whether you want application naming. And again, the notes for that is on this page as well. So even though you start up with the SIT parameter set to a certain level of monitoring, you could choose to dynamically alter it and then take a look and see what you've collected. So it makes it really easy to play with some of those values, turn them on and off and see the type of data that you're collecting. So that's all about monitoring and performance. Let's talk a little bit about statistics. So I'll take a little breather because I've been going on for half an hour and see if there are any questions yet uh, in the queue. No? No, nothing in the queue. Oh, something in the chat now. Okay. Yeah, question is, should in the CEMN, the monitoring always be on only, or only on the analyzed task? Um, so you're talking about, this is the general facility monitoring, right? So monitoring status is on which means you're collecting monitoring data on all tasks, yes. If you wanna decide which ones or make any changes to that, then you have to code up a monitoring control table and you can actually choose you know, tasks that you wanna exclude as well, yeah. Okay, um, I'm not sure whether I can add a bit. I think the CMN is a task kicks transaction you can run to yes. set the monitoring on, then you can exit finish that task, then the kicks monitoring will still be on until next time you use uh, your oh, another okay. to turn it yes. on. Yeah, this is another angle. which I Yes, yes. So CEMN gives you the ability to dynamically alter monitoring, right? So maybe I wasn't clear. You can set these parameters in the SIT so that when the region comes up, you have a certain setting for monitoring. So for example, on this screen, you could see I have monitoring, exception, performance class, resource class all on, identity class off. What I could do is I could come in here and change any of these parameters, hit enter, and then hit PF3 to exit CEMN, and moving forward, that will be what is in place today within the environment, right? So this gives you the ability to dynamically alter whatever it is you might have set up during startup, yes. Good. So. In terms of statistics, right, the statistics domain will collect a variety of different pieces of data also written to the SMF data sets. That is SMF 110 type two records. You get various counts and wait times and processor and storage usage, right? And the interval recording can be set on and off using the statistics recording within the SIT, right? And it can also be altered using CEMT. Records can be processed with DFH STUP or DFH zero stat. There is a group called DFH dollar stat, I believe it is, in Kix, and you can install that. Uh, it's not part of uh, DFH uh, list, so you don't automatically get it. You have to physically install it. And then you can run a transaction called stat. It doesn't start with a C. And you could write out dynamic statistics, right, to... Um, uh, your, uh, uh, you can see them under SDSF under your Kix region. You put a little question mark and you get some of the values there, right? Now, you can also use Tivoli Decision Support or Kix Performance Analyzer to look at statistics data. So interval statistics, right? Uh, by default, you don't have them. So you, well, you, I guess it has a default interval, which is an hour now. I find a lot of customers run uh, statistics every 15 minutes because basically you get a number of records. It's not just one, but it's a few 
a uh, few records written every interval. So if you set up the interval every hour or every 15 minutes, you realize that's the number of records you're going to cut. So if you have it, let's say one per hour, you'll get approximately one record every hour for 24 hours if you run 24 by seven. If you do it every 15 minutes, yeah, it quadruples the number of records you write, but it's not a heck of a lot of them. You also get end of day stats, and by default, it's written at midnight if you run 24 by seven, or when you shut the region down during the day. Now, you can also request statistics using kicks commands, exec CICS perform statistics, or record now. You can also reset requested certain statistics can be reset. And then you get these unsolicited statistics, things like auto install or if you, uh, let's say, open or close a file, you'll get these unsolicited statistics records as well. So what's the easiest way to look at statistics and play with it during the day without going to too much trouble? DFH zero stat is really nice. There is an RDO group called DFH dollar stat. You do need to install it, then run the stat transaction. Now, he gives you this COBOL sample provided in source and load format, so you can actually change it if you wanted to. Uh, and it is a good example of uh, Kix statistics collection. You must set spool yes in the sit so he can write it out. So here's just an example, a little bit about DFH zero stat. So here we go. So if you do install DFH dollar stat, the group, right? You can type in the TRAN ID stat. Again, it doesn't start with a C. It throws people off because, you know, you're expecting a Kix transaction to start with a C. And then you get this main page. Now, this is from an older release of Kix, but who cares? It's the same principle. It'll show you the job name, Apple ID, the Sys ID, right? Uh, any kind of valid node, asterisk is the default, right? And then he'll show you statistics recording on the last reset time, the next collection time, right? So you get an idea that interval statistics in this example was set every hour. The elapsed time since the last reset was that, and the end of day stat time time is midnight, it could change if you wanted to. Now, if you want to decide what to select, you hit PF4 for report selection. You'll get a screen that looks like this. So these are the different reports available to you. Yes, this is an older release. So you sh certainly should run this in your current release of kicks. You should see some of these major topic areas like system status, storage manager, and you'll see a bunch of yeses and nos. And if you want to, you can change them from yes to no, however you want to do it, to take a look and see what you get in terms of the output for these statistics. Make sure you hit PF10 to save it, right? You could restore the defaults if you want to as well. Once you've hit PF10, you hit PF3 to go back to that screen over here, and you're going to hit a PF5 to print it, right? Now, once you've done that, so you changed your reporting, you saved it, you hit PF3, go back to the main page, you hit PF5, right, and he'll print it. Then if you go to SDSF and you put a question mark next to your region, and you'll see one of these S00000 dynamically created DD names here, and then you could view it or select it, whatever you want to do, and this is what the statistics may look like. Just keep in mind that if you're using this uh, screen that is not quite, you know, uh, extended, right, it'll be hard to see the entire thing, right, because it'll be smaller than you expect, and you might have to scroll to the right or left, and it'll give you some general statistics, right, VTAM open, active, some information on workload manager, which of course I've scrolled off the side of the page, uh, activity key point, log defer intervals. So these are some of the parameters we have set for the system. If you scroll down far enough, you'll find the dispatcher because I had it turned on. You'll see some ICV and ICVR times, right? ICV TSD. Then you'll see current um, uh, subtasking value, whether you're not using uh, CO mode TCB, and then the number of kicks dispatcher tasks, and so on. Eventually, you'll see a screen that looks like this. And I wish I would have scrolled to the right here, right? But this will show you all the different TCB modes available to kicks, your QR, your RO, any L8s and L9s that you might be using. And if you were to hit PF11 and scroll to the right on the QR line, it'll show you the CPU to dispatch ratio. Now, interestingly enough, in development, you won't get 80% or higher because who cares? It's development. It's not really being used that often. But if you look at it in a production environment, you're expected to see 80% or higher, and it'll show up on this QR line, right? So 
Um, yeah, I, I could do a demonstration of that, but it's better if you try it in your environment where you recognize the kicks regions. And again, the only thing I would look at is the type of reports that are available to you over here, right? So if you do dispatcher and MBS TCBs and you set these two to yes, right, you will see the QR CPU to dispatch ratio. If you scroll down to the one that says TCB modes, QR is at the top, go all the way off to the right. Okay. So what resources can you tune in the world of Kix, right? Kix could stand for ceaseless in consuming storage, but not really. I mean, today, the storage management within Kix is a lot better than it used to be. Most of it is above the line. A bunch of internal control blocks are above the bar, saving us some storage in the 31-bit area. Uh, hopefully, you've moved some of your applications or all of your applications above the line, and therefore, you have plenty of 24-bit storage as well. But nonetheless, if you're having storage-type problems, some of the things you can do, of course, is always split your regions into two different pieces. But nonetheless, you can take a look at various different storage areas to see how the utilization is going. So that's one area that you can tune if you're having storage problems. Uh, another area is multi-engine exploitation, right? So we already know that we can have alternate TCBs. There's only one quasi reentrant TCB, but if you can mark your applications thread safe, they can run on L8 or L9 TCBs, right? And what that means is that uh, you can actually pump more workload through a single Kix region. And I've seen some customers collapse hundreds of regions down to, you know, tens of regions, because they can run much more workload through a single Kix region. Just keep in mind that you're going to get more switching at the ZOS level, right? Because there's more TCBs involved. So I had one customer that, you know, they were primarily at capacity for their machine. They were running at 100% every day. And then running stuff like thread safe <laughs> can actually cause bigger problems, right? Because now there are more TCBs to switch between and you can cause uh, ZOS some problems. But assuming you have some spare capacity lying around by um, running stuff thread safe, you get better throughput. And sometimes you'll see a reduced usage of CPU, right? So some of the other things that I pay attention to is anything to do with I.O., right? So buffering techniques are very, very important. For example, temp storage. Do you use temp storage aux or do you use temp storage main? In the old days, I used to tell people there were only two good reasons for using temp storage aux, and that was you needed the temp storage to be recoverable. Anything recoverable has to be written out, right? Uh, the other reason was, is you're using so much of it, right? That the last thing you wanna do is use up all your Kix region storage. And that was great until version five when they moved temp storage above the bar. Now that temp storage is above the bar, I rarely use auxiliary temp storage unless I need recovery. So these are things that you can switch within your environment that you've been running like that for 100 years, but nonetheless, you can improve the performance because you could eliminate all the IO. So I literally had a customer on Friday of this past week call me up and they were saying, well, you know, my temp storage file was filling up. And I'm going, well, you shouldn't be using a file anymore. Do you have any recoverable temp storage, right? And you could easily see if you have any TS models that use recovery. If you don't, then you don't have any recoverable temp storage. And there's no reason for you to use temp storage aux, right? But other things within file control can be buffered properly, whether you're using RLS. RLS would be something that you have to take care of the tuning at the RLS level, not the kicks level. If you're using LSR, the buffers and strings come out of Kix, so that's something that you can tune. Logger, for example, is something you can tune how often it's offloaded, right? And so file control, anything to do with I.O. can be tuned and can drastically improve performance and reduce CPU. There are some network considerations, but a lot less than used to be. Like we used to worry a lot about data stream compression. Remember the, you know, you'd worry about the attribute bytes on a 3270 map. How many people are doing 3270 screens anymore? Today, it's more about, you know, going out over the web and making sure you're not, you know, I don't know, sending five meg GIFs to 
CICS with dancing chickens or something or going out to a website and extracting some picture and bringing that back into kicks. So there is some consideration when it comes to web-based traffic, but uh, 3270, I wouldn't worry too much about it anymore. Now, then comes the fact serialization. That's always an issue, right? There's always some sort of bottleneck because two people can't access the same record at the same time for update because you wouldn't get, uh, you know, integrity. So there's always types, there are integrity type issues that you'd have to worry about. So whenever you have to single thread resources, you might have some NQDQ issues. You might want to set some T classes so you don't want to run really heavily CPU based transactions too many at the same time you could transaction class them right and then thread safe can be a solution to that problem as well. So again, these are just some areas you can focus on if you're considering tuning right so again just some major rules do not tune for the sake of it just for the heck of it, because tuning can actually be counterproductive. Major constraints first, work with the big items first, the stuff that you think is going to save you the most money, and then you get to the smaller and smaller pieces. Do large changes gradually and monitor at regular intervals. Don't say, yeah, put in the change. I looked at it on the first day. Everything looked fine. Great. I don't need to look at it anymore. No, you got to look at it for a while to make sure that it just doesn't go to heck in a handbasket a week later. Yeah. Now, again, check kicks thresholds. Look at applications, right, during the design phase if you can. If somebody makes an application change, they should make you aware of it so that you can look at a before and after picture, right? You get your baseline and then you see how the application is performing after the change. I had a major constraint with a bank in the US that put in some um, application change and it went well in development and in acceptance testing. And then the first run in production was a nightmare because the response time literally halved, right? So whatever used to take, let's say, I don't know, 500 milliseconds took a second or something like that. But it depended on the volume as well. And, and some of it ran through batch. But basically the transaction, which was long running, didn't complete any more in an hour. It took two and a half hours and it affected everything else in the system and they had no idea and they had no back out strategy. So it was pretty ugly, yeah? Um, so you gotta be very careful. Anyway, making a change, where do you look to see how well it's performed? Kick statistics is a perfect place to go, right? Again, statistics is at the region level. You can see how your T classes are you doing. You can see how storage is doing, right? You could see temp storage or transient data statistics, dispatcher statistics, right? So statistics is a good thing to look at after you make a change. Now, just uh, wanted to complete the um, session with just a couple of tuning tidbits that we've seen over time. So one of the ones that everybody asks me about is how do you set max task? What's the idea behind max task? Well, in truth, max task is really only there to limit the amount of storage that Kix uses. Believe it or not, theoretically, there shouldn't be any max task setting. You could run an unlimited number of transactions per second, as far as I'm concerned, as long as you have the storage to support it. The problem is, is the storage is not unlimited. And therefore, max task should be set to, if you ever hit it, then you have enough storage to cover it. And therefore you would never go short on storage. Having more tasks can run per second than you have storage available for it would mean that you run short on storage, right? Which can cause bigger problems. So these are some possible starting points. Mathematically, you take the transactions per second, multiply by 1.5, long running transactions time 1.25, add 25 for conversational tasks, and then some if statements over here. Bottom line is, is max task is also used to determine the number of performance blocks generated, the total number of performance blocks, which also eat into your storage, is max task plus the number of system tasks plus one. So just keep in mind by default, max task, right, uh, is uh, set to, uh, um, well, actually, it's the other way around. If you set max task, the max open TCBs is set to max task times two plus 32, right? So keep in mind, if you set a really high max task value and you don't need it, 
then chances are if you ever achieve or reach that area, the next thing you're going to know is that um, the system will go short on storage before you ever get there. So I'd rather hit max task first and realize, oh, I was only using 75% of my storage, then I know I could raise max task. Yeah. So again, uh, is if, there a quick question sure, about EOD end of state task? stats produce more stats data compared to SMF 110 type 2? Um, end of day stats does not produce more. It produces it at the end of day, right? Okay. It's the same set of data that you would see on an interval basis, but that's interval related. And then it's kind of summed up in end of day stacks. So end of day stats will show you a full day's worth. Interval will show you just that interval. Yeah. And some of those statistics are reset after an interval, but end of day stats will show you a whole day's worth. Does that make sense? Yeah. Then there is a, some other question sure. around this is, is there any way we can get those records from SMF 110 or just produced by EOD stats? No, no, you'll see them in, uh, there is an end of day stat record written to SMF. Absolutely. Yes. You can collect them from SMF. I know that because I run Kix PA, and if you run a, a tool like Kix Performance Analyzer or something, you'll see a different record type. One is uh, interval statistics, and the other is EOD statistics, right? End of day stat, right? So if you actually, I don't know if I can, let me just switch out of here for a minute. Oh, I wasn't disconnected, how nice, right? So if you go into, I don't know if I can look at interval statistics. Right here are the different types. So I can show you this. EOD is a separate type. So end of, end of day, interval, unsolicited statistics, requested statistics, right? So they're different types of records. Absolutely. Does that make sense? Yeah. So another thing is um, EOD sure. stats produce more stats on TSQ in shared pool, whereas the KXPA shows only few SMF type. 110 type two. Say that again. Lost, I think it's around um, um, the TSQ in shared pool stats. Does right. EOD produce more than maybe other type? I don't They're think the so. Same, right. Mm -hmm. They should be the same, exactly the same. Yeah. yeah. If you're yeah, having a. An offline. Yeah. It, it's, it's one of mine. Um, oh, okay. And, and we know it's the peculiarity here. Okay. Yeah. We're still uh, we're kind of scratching our heads, but I, I chatted it through with um, Steve Foley the other day. Right. Uh, I think we've got a bit more of a clue about what's going on. But it, okay. it did with um, last year's date for um, um, TSQs in a coupling facility. Oh, okay. Well, it should be the same. So if it's not, there's an issue there, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I can't say I've looked specifically at TSQs in the coupling facility you know, quite often enough to be able to say that, um, but if it looks different to you, then there's a problem. So we, we, we have to take a look at that, but it should yeah. be the same. I never have a chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. perfect. Uh, let's see if I can try and, yay. Oh no, sorry about that. Don't get too dizzy yet. That's what happens when you break out of one of these things. Sorry, okay, there we go. So again, uh, possible solutions if you actually do hit max task, right? You can always increase the region size if you have some more storage to go, right? That's why we kind of run with uh, region size of zero meg. And if you have enough EDSA limb, right, then you can always up the max task value. So sometimes you'll hit max task and you go, well, I still have, I don't know, 25% of the region size I've allocated to EDSA. So you're going to up max task. And then suddenly you hit short on storage before you hit max task and you say, well, do I have any storage left to give it? And sometimes you can raise EDSA limb to cover it. So you're always trying to play that game, but realistically max task is only there to control the amount of storage you use, right? Now, of course, there's some statistics you can look at. You can see the number of times you're at max task and how many transactions were delayed for max task. So for example, I know this is gonna sound strange, but I actually like to hit max task once or twice a week, yeah? That means I have it tuned perfectly, right? It depends on how many tasks were physically delayed. If I only get a couple of tasks delayed for max task, I'm not gonna worry about it. 
the fact that I hit max task and I had some transactions delayed. It's if I hit max task and have, you know, 70 or 100,000 transactions delayed, then I got a problem, right? Then my system needs max task to be higher, which means I need a higher storage allocation. Yeah. Now, one of the things you can do to control things like resource hogs or single thread application access is to use T class, right? Transaction class. Now, the idea behind T class is you put a number of different tran types in a single class. You can have one class per transaction if you really wanted to. And this gives you the ability to limit the number of simultaneous transactions of a certain type at a certain time. So you might use it for resource hogs. You might want to have single threading through one type of transaction. And so you could literally allow only one of them to run at a time if you really wanted to. You could avoid things like MRO sympathy sickness or control SOS things below the line, right? I know I can run 15 of these transaction types. They use below the line storage. I really can't afford more than 15. I'll T-class it at 15. And anyone else who wants to run, I'll force them to wait. You can also use it to control access to resources like CPU or virtual storage or IO, right? Now, effectively, you set up a TRAN class name. Uh, DFHTCL uh, 0, 1 through 10 are built in by Kix. You could set them and choose what transactions live in those classes. Today, you can name them anything you want. Give them a good description so you know what you're talking about. Max active is the number of transactions you can run at a time. Purge threshold of no says you let an unlimited number of waiters. I don't like that. Uh, I generally set it somewhere. It doesn't matter what it is. If my max task is 100, I certainly didn't want more than 100 people waiting for just this class type. So I'll usually set it to that or less. Keep in mind, whatever the purge threshold is, let's say you set it to two, it means that only one guy can wait, right? Because purge threshold is one less than what it should be. It's not a wait threshold, it's a purge threshold. So if you set it to one, for example, no one can wait, right? Because it purges the first waiter. That's what it means. Yeah. But it's interesting. You could set that. Okay. Now, I still mention this, although I don't find a lot of task priorities left. Kick supports task priority. You could set a priority by brand ID, by terminal ID, by user ID. They can all be set to up to 255, but the max is 255. And if you wanted to, you can actually set priorities in the system. But I find most customers don't bother with this because they expect everything to run sub second. So the fact that something runs 10 milliseconds before the other makes no difference at all, right? But anyway, you could use priority settings. You should use them sparingly. For example, in systems where I do set priorities, I'll have like 250 as one priority and 100 as the other. I'll make them so different and I'll probably only use one or two of these and I'll put all like the batch transactions in the lower priority ones. So at least, uh, you know, I'll get some sort of priority to more important transactions. But if you're going to use priority, then you have the whole concept of priority aging which was a way to fix problems, you know, transactions that were waiting forever. The longer you're in the system, the higher your priority ups by itself. So eventually you'll get to run. So there's no starvation involved, right? But in general, don't use them too much. Most customers do not. And so that's why I kind of overview it, but I don't talk a lot about it. If you have a priority oriented system, then you know what you're already doing. But I'd go back and tell you if you're running with a priority oriented system, you should have a look and see whether or not it's having any effect whatsoever, right? Sometimes it's better to remove the priorities and just do first in, first out, right? except if you're running batch in kicks. My, my experience with priority aging, um, it can have unforeseen consequences, yes. particularly with long-run tasks. Absolutely. And that's why it's dangerous, right? Just just priorities today in general are, are dangerous. So what I've kind of done is I've used separate regions to isolate those really bad transactions like the batch work. I'll have like a batch region or something. And that works better for me than trying to manipulate priorities along with priority aging, right? Or turn off priority aging. Yeah. True. Then there's some general things, uh, region interval control uh, value or ICV, how much time will kick sleep when he has no work to do? It won't have much effect 
during the day, right? Because kicks never sleeps. But maybe at night when there's not a lot of workload going on, you could set, I usually set a value of 10,000 or higher. And then maybe it'll give batch a slightly higher priority when no work is coming into kicks, right? And so you might see me use that. ICVR runaway task. Here's the other thing I find too many people do not set runaway task at the task level. So my recommendation is to set, especially in those regions where you have some really bad transactions, right? Most of them should run whatever the system value is, but the bad transactions on the tran ID itself, you should set the value on that transaction specifically that's bad, right? Because you know, in, in general, um, our systems are getting faster and faster. So my system value for ICVR is usually 500. Right, because I expect in the fast systems today that none of them use, you know, uh, um, more than 500 milliseconds of CPU before it gives up control. Right, and so I usually run everything at the system, and then a couple of bad transactions I set individually. Right, and so that's my recommendation. Why? Because if you set it at the system level to 10 or 20 or 30 thousand, like you might see in some MQ regions. Right. Then what happens is, is if you do get a transaction that runs away, he uses 30 seconds of CPU before you blow them away when you probably should have blown them away after half a second of CPU. And that's money. Right. So then in terms of always set a D timeout value, I don't know if I do it for every transactions, but for most of them, this is like a suspend timeout. If a transaction is suspended for an, a long period of time, then you actually want to blow it away. Uh, and then you should track to see how many abends of that type ATCH that you might see uh, because you've hit some D timeout value. So D timeout, of course, can be set on the transaction definition. You have to make sure that S purge is turned on. And then effectively, you can see how many transactions will be abended by that. And you go have a look and see if it needs more time. So one of the areas you can look at, of course, is the dispatcher statistics, right? So this is the statistics available through the dispatcher. You see the total number of transactions, user and system. You can see the current max task, right? And then you can see things like current number of tasks, peak number of tasks, and your ICV, uh, ICV TSD uh, should always be zero today, right? But nonetheless, this is just an older uh, statistics page. Okay, so just keep in mind there are lots of areas and kicks that can be tuned to get the best results. Tuning must be ongoing. You can't just do it and forget it and come back five years later. You kind of should schedule time to do tuning at proper intervals. Always start at the top down and work your way down. Set reasonable objectives. You're not going to save that much money right off the bat. But over time, and as you make some changes and you, you have the history of all the changes, when you add them all together, it could be significant, right? And then always measure and always publish your results, right? Because you want to get credit for what you've done. So I will now open it up to questions. Any questions? I see I just made the time. Sorry, I'm in shock for you making the time. Yeah, isn't it crazy for me, right? <laughs> I'll just Please. post up for feedback, folks, to match that um, uh, foil that Ezreal's put up. Ezreal, thank you so much. Um, a really good um, basics, uh, again, for performance tuning, very, very comprehensive. The one uh, that I, that's... Um, um, I'm looking at the questions just now, right? So um, I think... I've got a question. I, yeah, I see a couple. It says, in previous slides... Oh. What do you mean by performance bottlenecks in channel paths? Do you have a, a sample? Um, you'll know if you have one. Uh, if you're not having a performance bottleneck in a the path, then you, you'll know it, right? Generally, it's at the network level, so I wouldn't worry about that too much. Uh, that was something we had to worry about mostly in the past, right? And then there's a question about TCB switch. Uh, if we need to drill further, like what is causing this TCB switch? Can this be monitored from Omegamon or sample jobs presented? Yes, Omegamon will show you how many TCB switches today, all the way down at the program level. That's brand new. You have to run Omegamon version 5.6. Uh, the other thing you can do is run like trace. I use CProf, which is our trace collection Pro, uh, you know, product, uh, and it'll show you the commands that cause the TCB switches. So yes, the best way to see TCB switches is at the trace level. 
Okay. So now we've answered the questions. Go ahead, Rob. Sorry. Uh, M MCTs. Um, I have a cut down MCT, which I've kind of inherited. Um, yes. We're always adding fields for new releases and taking them out. Uh, and also in between releases, having to deploy extra fields for uh, too late to, for investigations and things like that. And you mentioned um, using compression and cutting full fat MCTs, mm. maybe taking fields out at group level, mm -hmm. things like BEPI or BTS people might not want to use anymore. Right. Uh, but uh, is that generally what you see nowadays rather than people getting too stingy with their fields? I find I find that people and, and you can do a measurement before and after. I find that uh, cutting out fields from the MCT does not save you much in terms of storage anymore. The compression algorithms are so good that when those fields are empty, they're compressed out anyway. Right. So, you know, going to the trouble of running a specific MCT to eliminate uh, fields, you'd have to eliminate a heck of a lot to do better than the compression that kicks is already have in place. So most of the MCT changes I see today is the addition of fields. Like, um, you know, I could show you some samples with kicks PA where, you know, I can add an additional field for web description, right? Because there's some customers that run various web services under the same TRAN ID, and I still want to break it out into a report. And then, you know, I'll create an MCT record for that. But uh, I find that is more of what I see today than the elimination of fields. Yes. Okay, brilliant, Ezra. Thank you yep. so much. Um, I think we'll wrap up now. Uh, okay. In the in the chat, um, you're back on after rushing off to another session in real life later yes. on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see you later on. But next, um, it, next one we've got a bit of a gap. It's uh, two o'clock, session four J. Um, with Stu Francis, who's going to talk about um, Ansible and automation in Kicks. So anyone who's interested probably in Python and good things that we've done in Rex in the past, uh, it could be a good session for you to get up yep. to date going on with that. Thank you so much, Ezreal, again. And Thank uh, you, everyone. I'll see you I'll later. see you again in uh, a couple hours. Yep. Yep. Cheers, Ezreal. Cheers. Bye for now.